Romans chapter 10. Uh, we're going to revisit verse 9 and 10. I, just, I couldn't drive on by and keep going. There's some things we still need to look at, so we're going to do that today. So follow with me if you would. Beginning in verse 5, let's follow Paul's flow of thought. He says, For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law. The person who does the commandment shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? That is, what does righteousness by faith actually say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is, the word of faith that we are proclaiming. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Father, we thank you today for this opportunity to gather as the body of Christ in this place. Father, I thank you for the word today. As we again come to Paul's words to the church at Rome. And Lord, we, we seek to understand your word through this dear brother as we seek to grab a hold of the message that he was proclaiming, which is the very same message that is needed today like never before. Lord, I pray that you would give us a heart and mind for the word, that you would, Father, give us a hunger for who you are, and how you have made yourself known to us. Lord, help us to understand the gospel, the essential, non-negotiable gospel. And may it truly transform us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I heard recently David Jeremiah, and I love David Jeremiah, dear brother, fellow pastor, he's pastor at Shadow Mountain out in San Diego. Talking about our cultural context, David Jeremiah said this, he said, there is a moral and spiritual war for the souls of Americans. Now, he didn't say for the soul of America. The souls of Americans. We're talking about people, individuals, not some um, hard to grab hold of concept. There is a war, a moral and spiritual war for the souls of Americans. And this war must be waged by preaching the gospel, by prayer, and by obedience to God's word. I want you to notice what he didn't say. The souls of Americans are not warred and waged war on political levels, governmental level levels, cultural levels. It's waged by brothers and sisters in Christ preaching the gospel, praying, and being obedient to God's word. Do you, do you really want to know what the key to our future is? If indeed we have one in this time and space, it's in people actually believing the gospel, proclaiming the gospel, praying for brothers to come to know Christ, and being obedient to that gospel themselves. Seems kind of simple, doesn't it? It is simple. It's not easy, but it is simple. In Romans chapter 10, Paul is delivering an argument. Now, we have a particular understanding of the concept of argument. We argue you're wrong and I'm right. But genuine argument is building a case with solid evidence in an attempt to convince. That's what Paul is doing. He's giving an argument on the universal importance of the gospel. It's an argument that is an answer to a challenge. The challenge is, Paul, what about Israel? You have just laid out a case that 
God's chosen people, Israel, for the most part, have rejected what you consider to be the means to being righteous before God, to meeting a standard. And yet, for the most part, Israel rejects that. Paul, how do you answer, well, then what about Israel if they are God's chosen people? The gospel of salvation by grace through faith through the person of Jesus Christ. If they've rejected that, if that's the power of God to salvation, Paul, how do you answer that? How, how, do, you, how do you defend that? Now, I hope you see, I've assumed, and I'm not going to get into the details of this, but I, I see and I'm assuming that you understand the relevance of this question to life in our day. In 21st century a 21st century, multicultural, pluralistic American cancel culture where everyone's opinion is seen as equally true and yet no one's opinion is seen as absolute. And yet, if you dissent from the popular narrative, you're dismissed and canceled altogether. We are living in a messed up culture, a really messed up culture. We don't know up from down. We don't know right from wrong. And the vast majority of people don't know which restroom to use. That's funny, but it's not. What in the world has happened? Well, Paul has pretty much explained our problem way back in Romans chapter 1. And he ought to know. He said, we've got a gifted Jewish rabbi brilliant intellect, former leader of the high court of Israel, zealous for the law of Moses, fastidious in his religious practice, a persecutor of those who followed the Nazarene, the way, who now has himself become a follower of the way. More than that, he has become the primary expounder of Christ to that very culture. And his story really is astounding. It really is. Paul's story is amazing. It's arresting. It's a testimony to God's grace. But you know what? Lest you think Paul is that much more special than you are, he's not. Because your story is a testimony of God's grace as well, if indeed you've come to know this Jesus that Paul is talking about. Well, as he answers this question, he is helping us to understand, he's helping Israel to understand the problem with Israel is their own failure, and their own failure is their own fault. They have misunderstood the law, they've taken the law, and they've turned it into something it was never intended to be, and in doing that, they have stumbled over the fulfillment of the law, they have stumbled over Christ himself. They are seeking to do what man in his default state as a fallen creature does, establish his own brand of righteousness, justify himself before the God who created him. That's what we do. That's what happens when you miss the defining truth of Christianity, and the defining truth of Christianity is that Christ is the end He's the purpose. He's the goal. He's what the law always pointed to. He's what the created order points to. He is the creator. He is God. When you misunderstand that, when you misunderstand the person and work of Jesus, you will wind up seeking to establish your own standard. Now, let me just remind you why this whole narrative with Israel is so important, and in doing so reminds you why. All of the Bible is important, not just the New Testament, but the Old. I told you a few weeks ago that the Old Testament, and the way Paul is, is giving us this answer here, he's, he's helping us to understand that Israel, to a, to a large degree, has become an object lesson. It's, Israel has become a microcosm, an acted parable of spiritual truth, if you would. He is helping us to see that The human condition is on display in Israel. That is, if you can see it, you can see you. You can see exactly what people left to their own schemes and ways tend to do. We are notorious for seeking to take God's provision 
and make our own provision. We seek to be right with God on our own terms. That's what Israel had done. Chosen, blessed, shown the way, and yet seeking to establish not righteousness by faith, but righteousness by the law. Paul's explaining that to us. He's, he's brought us down the path to where we are here in Romans chapter 10. And as we come to the text that I want us to see this morning, last week I, I looked at it under the banner of getting the gospel right and how important it is to get the gospel right. Well, we need to look at something a little more specific than the gospel right in general terms. I want us to look specifically at what Paul tells us here, again in verses 9 and 10, as he shows us what I believe is the essential components, the mandatory content of the gospel. Look at it this way. If you have an opportunity to engage someone in a conversation and you have the opportunity in the course of that conversation to seek to lead them to the truth of Jesus. What you would be doing is what we would be calling sharing your faith, or although I'll be honest with you, sharing your faith is really almost a worthless term now, because in sharing our faith, we tend not to get to the thing that matters most. Sharing the gospel. But then again, I would caution you, if you don't actually get to the gospel, the essentials of the gospel, you haven't really shared the gospel. If you had that opportunity, what exactly would you say to them? And more specifically, what must you show them? What is essential in order for someone to come to know the truth that would set them free? So let's look at what I want to call the content of the gospel under the banner of the essential gospel this morning. Again, look at verses 8, 9, and 10 of Romans chapter 10. But what does it say? Remember, the it is the righteousness by faith, not righteousness by law, not the, the, the standard that Israel was trying to meet on their own, but the righteousness that is by faith. What does it say? Here it comes. Here's what Paul says. The word is near you, in your mouth, in your heart. That is the word of faith that we are preaching, the message that we proclaim, the gospel as we proclaim it. Here's the essential. Here's what brings righteousness by faith. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and thus has righteousness. That is, he is justified. And with the mouth one confesses and thus has salvation. So let's look at this this morning. What exactly do you have to know content-wise to know the gospel. How much detail is there? How much basic information is essential to share your faith with somebody, to share the gospel with someone? You know, a lot of people, it's estimated nine out of ten or more people professing to be Christians have never once attempted to lead somebody to Jesus. Why? Is part of it because we don't know what to say. Well, let's take care of that problem this morning. Now, I told you last week there's a simplicity to the gospel. There is. The gospel is very simple. It's not hard to understand the gospel. But you know what? It's hard to believe the gospel. Does that make sense? Does that confuse you? It's not hard to understand the gospel. But sometimes it's hard to believe it. You know why it's hard to believe? Because if you truly know what you are and you truly know who God is, you can't help but ask yourself the question, God, why would you care to save a sinner like me? That's hard to grasp. Now, if you think real highly of yourself and you don't think you're that bad and you're a pretty thoroughly righteous dude already, you're not going to see this. The only problem is you're not a thoroughly righteous dude already. So the first thing we got to do is help you understand what you are. Well, let's look at this, verses 9 and 10, the, the content of the gospel. We touched on it last week, but let's, let's clarify this this week. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Paul said that's the word of faith that we preach. In the verse immediately preceding that, in verse 8, he uses that language, the word of faith we are preaching, present tense, this is our message. 
This is what we are declaring and making known. We are proclaiming it, and, and this is it. Two things. You must confess and believe that Jesus is Lord. That deals with the person of Jesus. It really does matter who Jesus is. You have to know who the... you got to get the right Jesus. And you must believe and confess that God raised Him from the dead. That addresses the work of Jesus. The resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. The person and work of Jesus. That is the basic content of the gospel. That is what I would call the essential components of the gospel. Paul reduces it to two realities. The core message can be reduced to two basic truths that are loaded with meaning and demand explanation. You can't just throw out the generic phrase, Jesus is Lord, without understanding what is he saying, which means you're going to have to explain some things. By the way, that's what you see all throughout the book of Acts. You think of the conversion of the Philippian jailer. You know the story. Jailhouse rock at midnight. Paul and Silas, beaten, battered, bruised, broken, bleeding, in shackles, singing, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that sang the saved wretch like me. That's what they were singing. Trust me. Only they were singing it in Greek. All of a sudden, there's an earthquake. They're set free. The jailer who's responsible for everyone in there is going to take his life. Claim the gospel to them. It's not just a matter of giving a generic statement without explanation, exposition, and understanding. Jesus is Lord. If you haven't picked up yet, we're going to spend a little time understanding that this morning. And then not only that, the second essential is God raised him from the dead. Jesus is Lord, God raised him from the dead. That tells us who he is, what he did, and why he did it. That's the essential gospel. Now, let's, let's remember something. I'm, I'm not going to get into the details of this because we talked about this last week, but just remember this. The language that Paul uses here is you've got to, this, this is a heart mouth thing. That's a metaphorical use of two particular parts of human anatomy to convey something much more profound than a beating heart and a speaking mouth. The heart is a reference to the very core of the being, the essential nature of what it means to be. Rationality, the mind, emotion, the feeling, volition, the will. You must believe this with all that you are. It makes sense. There's an intellectual element to it. There is an emotional element to it. How can the gospel not stir you? But there's also a volitional element to it. There's a commitment to it. It's not just mouthing words. It's actually living the words. That's the essence of confessing with the mouth. It's, in essence, living it with the life. The gospel is transformative. So, it's not empty words. It's not religious ritual or sentiment. It's a life that confirms what you say you believe. It is a life that's defined by two essential truths. Jesus is Lord. He's raised from the dead. So, what exactly do we mean by this? Two non-negotiable essential components to the gospel. The word of faith that we are proclaiming that we are to proclaim. Number one is Jesus is Lord. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord... Now, let's begin with the most obvious thing. The most obvious starting point for the gospel is Jesus. Now, that seems obvious, doesn't it? But you would be surprised if you really listened and paid attention how little of Jesus is actually mentioned in what many consider to be the gospel. It's amazing what passes for Christianity today how very little Jesus seems to be involved in many people's understanding of Christianity and believing. But here we're reminded that He is where it all begins. Christianity starts and ends with the person 
of Jesus Christ. And that means understanding Jesus Christ. The gospel is defined by the person of Christ. Who he is, what happened to him, what, what did he do, what happened to him, and the meaning of it all. And again, that seems obvious, but the reality, unfortunately, is otherwise. It all starts with Jesus, confessing Jesus. But not just a general confession, not just a generic statement. It, this is not saying, I believe in Jesus. I got news for you. The devil believes in Jesus. I got further news for you. He believes better than you do. He knows more than you do about Jesus. Are you, listen, he would win every debate and argument with you about the person of Jesus. But you know what? I don't see any indication that that's had any kind of an impact on changing him. Kind of reminds me of a lot of people I've encountered through the years who profess the name of Jesus, but I knew them before, and I know them now. Not a lot of difference. I don't know about you, but the way I see and understand the New Testament, people that encountered Jesus in a saving relationship, their life changed. They weren't the same old conniving, manipulative, cussing, ugly dude. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Can you, can you, can you testify to that? Can you verify that? It's not just some generic statement. Two absolutes. Absolute number one, Jesus is Lord. What does Paul mean when he says Jesus is Lord? And why is it critical to the gospel? Of all the things Paul could have said, he said, this is the message we proclaim. This is what righteousness by faith is. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is kurios. Greek word kurios is the word Lord. He uses it four times. Bang, 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 bang. Just like that in this declaration. Verse 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord... A couple of verses later, verse 12, there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing His riches on all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Lord. The, lo the word kurios is both a title, a descriptive title, but it's also a name. The basic word kurios means master or Lord, as in boss or owner. So when we talk about Jesus being Lord, if what Paul is talking about is just the generic title, the descriptive title, then we understand that Jesus is my boss, right? Jesus is the boss of me. You ain't the boss of me. How many times have you said that to somebody? Why did you tell them that? Why did you say to somebody, you ain't the boss of me? What's the, what context did you say that in? Somebody was telling you to do something. You didn't want to do it, right? And you wanted to show how big and bad you are. You ain't the boss of me. I don't have to do what you say. You know, unfortunately, too many times we say to Jesus, you're not the boss of me. You say, oh, come on. We don't say that. Oh, yeah, we do. We don't say it with attitude, but we live it with attitude sometimes. Willful disobedience, we know the truth, but we don't live the truth. That's, in essence, telling Jesus, you're not the boss of me. It's a title for ownership. That's the simplest, most basic meaning. And that is certainly true for the believer, but that's not what Paul is saying here. Paul is not saying Jesus is Lord in the context of he's the boss. He's using the word Lord differently. He's using it as a name. How do you know that? Well, you know, Paul has this notorious habit of backing everything he says up with Scripture. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. He makes this theological assertion, and he just is quoting Scripture. He's quoting, he's quoting the Hebrew Scripture all over the place. Well, that's what he's doing right here. In Romans 10.13, that's the reason I want you to see the four occurrences of 
Lord. He makes this statement, you must confess that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead. From the dead. You, you've got to confess him as Lord. He shows us what he means by showing us where he got this. And what he does in verse 13 is quote Joel chapter 2 verse 32. Listen to what the prophet Joel says in Joel chapter 2 beginning in verse 30. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord come. The great and awesome day of the Lord coming turns out now at the time they certainly didn't understand all this. But what we find out is Joel is referencing the coming of God in judgment. For us, it is the second coming of Christ. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and it shall come to pass on that day, in that time of judgment, that everyone who calls on the name of Yahweh, the Lord, that's the covenant name of God, everyone who will call on Yahweh, the Lord shall be saved. And in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Now, here's the deal with this word kurios in the, in the New Testament and its connection to the Old Testament word Lord. In the 2nd century B.C., late 2nd, early 3rd century B.C., the Hebrew Old Testament was translated into Greek. Why? Because the Greek language had become the English of its day. It was the lingua franca, the universal language. So Hebrew scripture was translated into Greek. In fact, that's the Bible of the early church, the Septuagint Old Testament. It's abbreviated the 70, LXX, if you ever see that. In fact, I've left it in your notes that way, I believe. The Septuagint translation of the Hebrew Scripture, the Greek word that was used for Lord, the name of God in this passage, is the word kurios. So the Greek translators of the Septuagint took this covenant name of God in Joel chapter 2 and rendered it with the Greek word kurios. That's what Paul is quoting. He's quoting a name, not a title, a name. And he's referencing Jesus with that name. Do you know what that means? You know why that's important? What he's saying is Jesus is the covenant God. Jesus is God. So to declare that Jesus is Lord, to proclaim the gospel, it's, an, it's essential that you help someone understand who Jesus is. He's not just some first century Jewish wise guy. He is God, which gives you an opportunity to help them understand why Christmas is so important. Right? Ho, 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 who wouldn't go? I wouldn't. I, that's who. Christmas is about the coming of Jesus, God in human flesh, the incarnation. It gives you an opportunity to help someone understand Jesus took upon himself human flesh, he became like us so that he could identify with us, die for us, that we might be forgiven. That's why that Jesus is Lord is so essential. It is an insight into the person of Jesus Christ. It tells us exactly who Jesus is. And listen, you have to know who He is. The staggering fact is that to be a Christian is to confess and to believe with every fiber of your soul that Jesus Christ is God. He is not a God. He is the God. He is the risen Lord Jesus, the Lord. That's what a Christian believes. He's not a good man. He's not, he's not, he's, he's not just a, a good man. He is the God man. He's not a moral teacher. He's not a model to be imitated. He is your God. He is your creator. He is your redeemer. Jesus as Lord is absolutely loaded with significance. 
And we need to understand that. It's absolute. It's an absolute essential that you know who Jesus is. It matters who Jesus is. That's the first one. Jesus is Lord. You want to help someone become a follower of Jesus? Help them understand who Jesus is. Are you really a follower of Jesus? Do you know who He is? Because who He is has radical implication for your life. The second essential absolute, God raised Him from the dead. And believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you'll be saved. Jesus as Lord tells us that He's God, that He's deity. Raised from the dead tells us He was put to death on a cross, buried, and three days later God raised Him from the dead, meaning what Jesus came to do, He accomplished. Jesus came to die for your sin. Jesus came to pay the ultimate cost for your sin. The resurrection validates the success of that mission. It validates that He accomplished what God designed the cross to accomplish. Jesus is Lord. He is the resurrected Lord. Listen carefully. You cannot be a Christian and deny the literal, physical, bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot be a Christian and deny the resurrection. Not some spiritual, ethereal, metaphysical resurrection. Literal, physical, bodily resurrection. It is essential. Pastor how, Pastor, how do you know that? How do you know you're not reading into it? Have you actually read the New Testament? The entirety of the New Testament is built around showing you the resurrected Jesus. The entirety of the New Testament is. It begins with four accounts, four gospel accounts. Remember what a gospel is? It's good news. No, yes it is, but it's more than that. A gospel is a, is a genre of literature that I like to call propaganda. Now, we usually think of the word propaganda in a negative term. Well, propaganda is something designed to convince me of something that's uh, kind of nefarious or not necessarily true. No, no, no. Propaganda, in its purest sense, is something that, that's written to persuade you to believe something. That's propaganda. The gospel is propaganda because it's designed specifically to convince you of something about Jesus. Four accounts. Well, that seems to me like that would undermine the credibility. Oh, no, that verifies the credibility. So you've got four separate accounts, four different witnesses, four different perspectives. That's why sometimes you see a little bit of a difference in the detail. But they all taken together are more confirming of the truth. We've got four accounts of valid eyewitnesses all pointing to a phenomenon. That is that Jesus bodily rose from the grave. We have an historical book that is built around these apostles preaching and going global with the same message. And the essence of their message is the resurrected Jesus Christ. For instance, the very first sermon preached in the, the founding of the church was by Peter on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, listen to the heart of his message. Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 24. Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan, and for knowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Peter's very first message, the very foundation of the church, is founded upon this message of the crucified, risen Jesus Christ. And then that was the consistent message. They wouldn't shut up. Two chapters later, they are arrested, threatened, beaten, bullied for one reason. Here's the reason. As they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them. 
and put them in custody. <laughs> they were preaching an annoying message. Now, how in the world is the resurrection of Jesus annoying? It's, by the way, it's annoying today, too, if you understand what it's saying. If you understand the resurrection of Jesus, who Jesus is, what happened to him, and why, it's annoying because it exposes you. It shows you that his death was for you because you are depraved, wicked, and sinful. You're not good. You're not all right. You're not righteous. You're worthy of death. Wouldn't it be annoying for somebody to constantly tell you that? Oh, wait a minute. That's the message of the church. It's the message of Paul. Acts chapter 17, he goes into Athens. And the message he preaches gets people's attention. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple, the Sadducees came upon them. Oh, wait a minute, that's Acts 4. Acts 17. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with Paul, and they said to him, or said about him, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he's preaching Jesus and the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus matters. Let me show you why in one simple statement by Paul in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 4, verse 25, 24 and 25. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. You know why the resurrection is so important? The resurrection validates who he is and what he did. And that is the basis of our justification. That's the basis of our meeting the standard of God. That's the basis of our salvation. That's why the resurrection matters. That's why it is essential to proclaiming the gospel that you proclaim that Jesus is Lord and that he is the raised, resurrected Jesus. Now, you're going to have to explain that, which means a gospel presentation is going to take more than 30 seconds. Can I... Can I tell you what I honestly believe about the last 60 years of American church history? Can I tell you what I honestly believe? I believe we have been guilty and complicit in raising up false followers of Jesus. Because we have gotten them to, to repeat verbally certain propositions without them ever knowing and understanding what it is they were affirming. That's why we've baptized six, seven, and eight-year-olds and then baptized them again in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. That's why you have somebody saying, I didn't understand the gospel and now I do. Because they did not know what you were talking about. But we did a really good job of putting it to a really neat tune. And they can sing the tune, but they have no clue what it means. By the way, that's human nature. We do that with music all the time. We sing songs we like because it has a good beat, but we don't really understand what they're singing. But if you actually stop and listen to what they're singing, you'd go, oh my goodness, I don't need to be singing that. Now, that may stun you a little bit. That may irritate you a little bit. That may annoy you a little bit. I would rather annoy you now and you come to see a truth that sets you free than to let you slide and you find out that you're on the broad path and you've missed the narrow gate altogether. The essential gospel, the basic content of the gospel. Jesus is Lord he is God who died for your sin and was raised to justify you. Before you ever communicate the gospel to someone, you really must know what the gospel is. You must know the content, the basic content of it. You, you need to know what it is. And you need to believe it. Not just an intellectual defense, but a life-defining defense. By the way, that is a consistent message in the New Testament. That is not something that I'm just pulling out of Paul. Let me close with showing you how Peter said the same thing. In the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1, Peter said, Jesus was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but he was manifest in the last times for the sake of you, for your sake, for believers. That is, Jesus, known before the foundation of the world, manifest in time. Jesus is God. He is Lord. 
He's saying the exact same thing in a slightly different way. For the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead, there's your resurrected Jesus, and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God, not in you. There's righteousness by faith, not righteousness by law. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. That's not a reference to sanctification. That's a reference to justification. That is, the risen Lord Jesus is the means by which you are able to obey the truth. That's the essential gospel. That's the gospel that sets men free. That's the gospel we must proclaim. Let's go back to David Jeremiah. Let me remind you what he said. There is a moral and spiritual war for the souls of Americans. Boy, that has become more evident than ever. This war must be waged by preaching the gospel. It's the gospel. This message is what wins the war. Prayer and obedience to God's Word. God, help us to be obedient to Your Word. Father, we thank You this morning for this brief opportunity to be reminded of what matters most. Some of us here today are all wrapped up in so many things in this world, but we're not wrapped up in what matters most. Christians need to understand what's at stake. We are not just skipping through our life waiting for the end. We have been deployed as soldiers in a war. And the war for the souls of Americans is front and center. And many professing Christians are complicit in the losing simply because we don't understand the gospel we proclaim or profess. Lord, help us to understand the importance of Jesus as Lord and you raised him from the dead. If this is true, if you invaded time and space in the person of Jesus Christ, and if the death of Jesus and his resurrection truly atones for the sin of fallen man, that is life changing. And that is the means by which spiritual warfare is won. Help us to preach the gospel. Help us to understand the gospel. To pray and to obey. In Jesus' name we pray.